教育劳工会。那啊、呃，第一次的话，呃，我们会呃有中文、英文一起同时进行，那我可以做一点中文的那个翻译。如果任何人需要帮忙的话，就是来找我没有问题。Great. So I'm not going to pretend to understand exactly what uh, Ian just said. I did actually live here in Taipei. I was at Taipei American School for about six years. So I, I, I speak Ian. So that's about as much as uh, Chinese as you're going to get out of here. Ah, I'm talking more about Chinese. I'm also a Taiwanese. Now, I'm currently in Taipei. I'm very excited to come to Taiwan. I'm very excited. So first off, I'd like to welcome uh, to the stage Tom Farrell, who is the superintendent here at Kaohsiung American School. Our teachers.
So there is um, a couple of uh, informational items I just need to make sure that you guys understand. A little bit about who we are as a tech team. Um, we are teachers, first and foremost. Like I said, I was in uh, Cafe American School, and I was recently in Singapore American School, uh, working there until this last uh, June. So we, we bring these professional development events in schools around the world, teachers around the world, uh, and we like a great number of people to help us out, like a leader, for example. Okay.
分享出来。如果今天有一同一个时间有两个呃工作坊，你很想去，可是你觉得哎，我只能去一个，你还是可以就是进去，然后找到另外一个工作坊的那个资源分享。Cool. So here's our schedule for day one.、Uh, I will tell you that we will probably run a little bit over on our on our keynote,、uh, but that's okay. We built in a 30 minute break. Between first and,、uh, between this session and the、uh, uh, uh, first workshop session, which will start around 10, but we'll probably start around a little bit later than that if we need to. That's okay. We're a flexible organization, and we like to make sure that we are、um, nimble. And so, if you print it out, the schedule. Sorry, please recycle that. You don't need that anymore because、uh, it did change last night.、Um, so、uh, the session times for today are as such, basically 30 minute breaks in between every session. 我们中间呃有留三十分钟的时间让大家休息，可是因为我们今天的时间比较弹性一点，比如说大家听众可能会呃多长一点点，那我们就是那个休息时间会缩短一点。所以如果你之前已经有印出来你的呃今天想去的 session， 我会建议大家再看一次，因为我们昨天晚上有在呃架架构什么新的那个工作网程序。Uh, we do have a very special session. Um, Vivian Lin is going to be running a session on、uh, Breakout EDU.、Um, if you've not、uh, played Breakout EDU, it's an immersive experience for for students where they solve puzzles and they try to break out of actually the the box. Of course, if you've been to、uh, one of those escape rooms, those are quite popular now. It's that same concept except for we can't lock kids in rooms. <laughs> that's not that's not good. Uh, they tell us so. We decide let's have them break out of the box instead. So there's locks that are, are that you'll be able to that they get to every bit. You'll have to be able to、uh, sort out. And there is a session. Uh, uh, it's in session three today. And there's a special link. There's only 24 spots uh, open. Um, for that, so you have to go in to sign up on that that、uh, session. 今天有非常特别的工作啊，我们有新加坡来的老师，他会介绍呃 breakout session。那如果还没有尝试这新的这种呃做法，他有点像呃我们在做虚报游戏。那、呃、一般的话，在各市里面呃是非常的吸引学生。那如果我们这二十四个那个名额，因为那个我们要做一个资源的分配，那如果会强烈建议大家如果有兴趣的话，赶快去报名。Uh, please uh, tweet out your Twitter. Use the hashtag at Tech Team. Um, also, at Google Plus, that's our tag there as well. We have the at symbol for our our actual、uh, account. And make sure that you're, you're tweeting out your, your、uh, pictures. Any learnings that you have, any aha moments, please share those. We have、uh, hundreds of thousands of people that follow that hashtag daily、um, and are exposed to that. So share out the great things that we're doing here in Kaohsiung and the things that you're learning as well. 我们在社交媒体上也希望看到大家，如果你今天有呃呃学到新的东西，或者你觉得哎真的很有兴趣。Uh, I will also、um, say your your name badge. This is your ticket. You have to have this to get into a workshop.、Um, tomorrow is the same thing. You need to bring the same、uh, name tag or name badge back with you. You don't have to register again tomorrow. But tomorrow we will have another special little game to be playing. Prizes to be won. So、uh, to, to motivate you to stick around for day two. Uh, but, but please make sure that you wear your name badge at all times. 嗯，大家的名牌是今天的票券啊，我们要凭票入场。那明天我们会用用你们的名牌来做一些小游戏，有很好很好的奖品。And then with that, we are ready to introduce our keynote speaker,、uh, Benson Yang, is a professor here in, in Taiwan,、uh, and co-founder of the Gamo,、um, which is you know, he's going to be talking about that and、uh, some of his.、Uh, Findings and his views on education today, and how we should be working with our students.、Um, so we're really, really、uh, privileged to be able to have this in here with us today.、Um, our connection with Acer,、um, one of our sponsors, they they were able to connect us together and bring、uh, bring bring us together so you can share his story and some of his views、uh, with you guys here today. So please welcome Benson to the stage.
It's all because of the hardware of it. You can come, tell you that it isn't, what is it? It's what, what, what? Look back. Okay. So you can do it as you do this 10 times a day, and pick up a good model of this, okay? I'm sorry for the model you just did. It's just that the book is quite nice, okay? In 2015, we, uh, 2015, we want, I, this book uh, won the 10 most influential book of the year, uh, award that year, okay? So you got to just think of, uh, uh, my talk today, if you are very interested, if you want to have a further study, and you are uh, good in Chinese, okay, you might try to uh, uh, check out further this book, okay? And because we have done a lot of innovation in, teach in teaching, and at least the last year, uh, I was very honored to get the most prestigious award in innovation of Taiwan, which is a, president, uh, a presidential innovation award, okay? But every time I show this picture, everybody asks me one question. Did you shake the hand with that guy? <laughs> okay. Because in Taiwan there's a theory that if you shake the hand with this guy, something will happen. Okay. But, <laughs> but then some people told me that don't worry, as long as you shake even number of times, you should be fine. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. So okay, so I think that I briefly introduced what I've done before, and now I want to talk about uh, what, uh, about my teaching. Well, about my teaching, my teaching career started about uh, in 2001. I was a PhD student in the University of Michigan in Auburn. And, but at the time, I got a lot of award, uh, TA awards. So the university, uh, they want me to invite me to be an HR manager for the department. So at the time, I started my teaching career. From year 2001 to 2010, I always feel that good teaching is about how to make your lecture being fun and being clear. So in these 10 years, I made a lot of effort to make my lecture very clear and very fun. And in 2010, I won the Outstanding Teaching Award in National Taiwan University, which is only awarded to the top 1% uh, professor in our university, which is a very prestigious award. Upon receiving that award, I started to have some illusion. When I received the award, I started to feel that, man, my teaching is perfect now. Okay. But the next day, I have a lecture to give in the classroom, so I go into the classroom, I still put all my effort to give the best lecture. But this time, I found that there are three or four guys back there fall asleep. <laughs> okay? Before I got the award, before I feel my teaching is perfect, people fall asleep too. But now I got the award, my teaching is perfect, man. How can anybody sleep in my lecture? Okay? So throughout my lecture, you know, it's as if you buy a, a laptop, it, if you are very unfortunate, you can find a laptop with three or four dead pixels. You just keep looking at those dead pixels, right? Through that, that lecture, I just keep looking at those three or four dead pixels. And I just keep asking myself, how can anybody sleep in such a perfect lecture? Okay. <laughs> that day, when I went home, I still couldn't get let go. I just, it keeps bothering me. That night, I couldn't sleep. Eventually, I found that answer. I found that if the student is not motivated, no matter how fun or how clear or how interesting your lecture is, it's just not going to work. So starting from that night, from 2010, from that night, uh, I start to have different pursuit in my teaching. I found that the, higher, the highest pursuit in teaching should be how can we get our students motivated, how can we get engaged. I think that's the most important thing. So starting from that, uh, I think after this down, the past seven years, I put a lot of effort in this. So, so how can we do that? Well, I think what you need to notice is that student nowadays are very different from our generation. Now, I still remember when I was a student, I was a very naughty one. Usually when a teacher teaches something, I don't have to teach them. Why are we learning this? And our teacher will tell us, oh, because this is very important. <laughs> okay. And then I don't let him go. I keep asking, why this is important? Then the teacher will start to think for a long time. And then he will tell us, you will know in the future. <laughs> okay. So we just get, get, you know, then we just get tricked to study, okay? But this kind of way doesn't work anymore. Because you know, they, they need motivation. Because there's so much fun stuff in your life. Learning, studying, is just fun thing. If you can ask, then they know why they need to learn. No, it's not going to work. So we need to help them to build motivation. So nowadays, students force them no longer works. As a teacher, we need to know that why do they care most? 
what do they care and what do they worry about. Okay? If you can find out why, what your students care about, what they worry about, then you can find the drive to drive them to get very motivated. It turns out I found that students now they care a lot about the peers. Okay? They don't care about how teachers look at them, that they, but they really care about how the peers look. So peer pressure and peer organization can really drive your students hard. So if you look at the key elements of the game, you know, but we all grow up like playing the game. Why? Because usually in the game, you have certain kind of competition. And if you do well in the competition, you get acknowledged by your peers. Your friends say, oh, you're so good. And you feel a sense of accomplishment. And also, if you have a, I think this is also very, very important for a successful game. You have a smart rule design. They don't have a bad time to address that. So you can see that the reason why we all like, like grow up playing, like playing games is because of the peer knowledge. Okay. So that's why we need to introduce this into our teaching. We do need to put this into our teaching and then you can get this to much more motivation. So modern teaching, this is what we usually do for the teaching. For the student, we all are doing this for the sake of students. We are good teachers. But we do a lot of things okay, so by the teacher. And we hope the knowledge can be absorbed by the student. Uh, become all the students by putting the question mark. Because students are not motivated, this doesn't work. So that's why I said my philosophy has been always for the student, by the student, of the student. We then need to let the student take more initiative in learning. And how can we do that? This is what I'm going to share with you today. Okay? So the case one, the first case I want to share with you is the, the first game that I developed about uh, six years ago. Okay? It's called PJD Online. And why am I doing that? Okay? <laughs> the reason is because in Asia, and not just in Taiwan, in Asia, a lot of college students, they copy each other's answers in home. Okay, those rats, I want to take care of this. Okay. So, usually when teacher encounter this in college, a lot of teachers just give up. But I refuse to give up. So I did some study, I want to check, see why they can cheat in the home. And it turns out I found that it's all because of the copy scores near the university. The company schools near the university, they all sell the like, solution manual to all kinds of subjects. <laughs> and we professors, a lot of times we just solve a problem on the textbook. The students have the answers, solutions right away. So, because I went back from the US, uh, so I, at the time I had around a collection of five probability textbooks. One of the book is very rare in Taiwan. So that's the best that I decided I want to choose the problem of that very rare book in Taiwan. But because I worry about students figuring out which book it is, so I decided to type every problem from the scratch. Okay? And I spent a lot of effort. Like, this guy in the problem, originally, this guy in the problem was called Tama. Why right? type it? I changed it to Michael. Okay? Originally, this, this lady in the problem was called Susan. I changed the name to uh, Jane. Okay? I put a lot of effort to retype the problem. And then I put it on the internet. Okay? And six years ago, a lot of students still, still use this kind of internet forum called PBS. Uh, each department has their own forum on the internet. So I post the problem and then I went to the internet forum to see students' response. And see, I see so many people whining and saying, Wow, man, this problem is so difficult. I spent two hours, I can literally even solve one problem. Because previously, when they talk about a solution manual, each problem only takes you know, about five minutes. But now they take 20, they, now they take two hours, they couldn't even solve one problem. So I just keep running, man, this is so difficult. And when I saw this, I feel, man, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of look at them to work on the problem on their own, okay? <laughs> For the next six days, I keep visiting the internet forum. I keep seeing them whining and whining and whining, and every day I feel so happy. <laughs> <laughs> but on the sixth day, sixth day, I saw a very strange post. The subject is, can anybody give me the solution manual of this book? When I see the name of the book, I was so shocked. This time, I figured out which book it is, the problems are from. Okay? But five seconds later, I became so mad. This guy had six days to solve the problem. But he didn't solve the problem. He used six days to figure out which book it is. And then ask for a solution back then. Okay? A lot of teachers probably give up already at the time. But again, I refused to give up. So then I, I, I summarized this. I thought that it seems that if I use the problem of existing books, students can always ask for solution manual. So it seems that I have to have brand new problems. But in probability, when you design a brand new problem, it takes a lot of time. And throughout the semester, I did over 100 problems. 
just me and TA, we don't have enough human resource for this. Man, I don't have enough human resource. I don't have enough human resource. Wait, I have 75 students registered for this course. 75 people is a lot of human resource. Who said the whole problem can only be assigned by the teacher? Why can we just let students design the problem? Actually, it was my conjecture at the time that if we let students design the whole, whole problem, they will learn even better. Because if you want to design a problem without any flaws, you need to study stuff really well. So this is what I do. I have 75 people, right? So at the beginning of the semester, I will separate the separate two group. Three people in the group, three people in the group, three people in the group. I have 25 group of students. Every time I finish a chapter, I say, okay, guys, I just finished chapter three. Every group is that one problem on chapter three. Boom. I have 25 brand new problems without any solution values out there. Okay? Then each group starts to conquer other 24 groups of problems. The more you conquer, the further you proceed on the map. This was our first version. Okay, so it was quite primitive, but you can see that those groups, they do very well. Okay, they proceed very further. And this, this guy, this group just goes around. And you need to know that the, 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 you know, the reason why students don't do the homework is because when they go home, they don't see other people working at the homework. So they don't feel the urgency. Okay, so that's why our system has a very considerable, yet quite evil design. We have the real time status update. Okay? So when students go home, they can visit the website, they find like, wow, group one already finished more than 10 problems. Wow, group two finished more than 20 problems. And wow, all group just less than 10 problems. They start to feel that the urgency they need to work hard. And also, let me ask you one question. When you assign homework to your student, if your student start working on the homework early, do you take any you know, advantage from that? No, because everybody handed the homework at the deadline. So if you start homework early, nobody knows, even your teachers don't know, right? So why bother start early? But now, things are different. If you start early, you know, people see your friend, your classmates say, wow, you can finish so many problems already. They get praise from their peers, and they feel very honored, they feel the sense of accomplishment. That's why they have more, much more uh, urge to do well. So this is a sophomore course of probability. So you might imagine that you know, probability is a very mathematical course. You know, a lot of x, m of x, m of y, right? Let me share with you what is the typical problem designed by my student, by our sophomore student of probability. One day, Plato asked Socrates what is love. Socrates asked Plato to go to the garden and pick the most beautiful rose for the rule. You can only pick once, and you cannot go back to pick a rose that you will pass by. It is Socrates' belief that Plato will hesitate to pick any rose due to the fear of next rose being more beautiful, and thus come back and be happy. Then Socrates can teach Plato about his philosophy of love. Nevertheless, Plato already knows from someone that there are only eight roses in the garden, so he comes up with a clever strategy. Treat the first three roses as samples to pick them. For the following roses, if there is one being more beautiful than first, all first three roses, just pick it without hesitation. This is the type of strategy of Plato, but the probability of Plato successfully pick the most beautiful rose in the garden. Okay. It's not X, F of X, F of Y. It's only Socrates, Plato, and roses. So beautiful. So what's our students' response? Okay, let me share with you. This is the response we saw on Facebook. June 16th. Okay, what was it? Okay, June 16th. Okay, this is the final exam week in our university. Each student needs to prepare eight to nine final exams. That's the most cultural week for our students that in our university. Does this student go? There are all problem sets left on PJP. I really want to solve that all. But then I will screw up the final exam. Sit on the system. He likes all the negatives. I feel so awful. June 17th, he wrote, I just can't help myself to more PJP problem sets. Think this guy has eight to nine final exams yet to prepare, but he still can help but to solve two more problems. So we can see that students' passion is really, you know, they really start to have passion toward this subject. And let me share with you another problem. You know, the gamification will bring out the best from the student. Uh, three years ago, two or three years ago, the movies, movie of Das Miserable was very popular in Taiwan. So one student, a group of students in that problem called Das Miserable, let me share with you. June 1832. A three zone in life in Paris. An old inn named Pinatius. 
The person who has been one year with Ned Ness Talking is a writer, Victor Hugo. The silent audience is his friend, an English poet. Suddenly, someone pushed the scratching door and dashed into the ink. Here comes our great mathematician, Passat, says Hugo. Okay, Passat is a very famous mathematician. French is a mathematician. They write into uh, this story, okay? Okay, this is still a lot. <laughs> Okay. On the street, a girl with brown hair just watches by. If I confess my love to Paris, would that be bothersome to him? If I am Paris, I would definitely want to to see this farewell letter from him. She continues to rush into the alley. Crash! The press fell off the boss in his head. Everything, everything, where are you going? Okay, this is a lot. She should be able to walk for some more distance. That's the super speed will drop a half at every time she gets. What is the probability of her successfully walking through the alley? Can you figure it out? You got charges to pass up. Course. And at the time, it started to want to have more course from other languages. 
So they came to our university right away. So they came to visit us, and I still remember that day in the morning, in talk about how our university could join the Coursera. And then that night, I invited him to, to the dinner. So during the dinner, because Andrew has a lot of passion to teach, so during the dinner, we talked a lot about teaching. He would talk about something about how you teach some course, and I would talk about something how I teach my course. It's like the people who do a street dance, you know, they charge each other, right? So the great teacher. So we are kind of like that. So we talk about how you teach, and then I talk about how you teach. And eventually, I mentioned the BJP online game. And then Andrew was so shocked. He said, hey, listen, I never see people teach best course using game like this. And he came to me, he said, hey, Benson, if you're a university journal or setup, can you make the first book? Okay, because he said, I never see people use the notification for book course, and I really, really want to see this happen as a server. And because of his strong encouragement, so I started to develop this new game, Pokemon, for our server course. So it was large. Uh, Pokemon was first launched in a public course at Coursera. Uh, at the same time, that we launched the Coursera course. And this is the game. The game looks like this. Okay. Basically, we have a, a very good uh, teacher's council. So the teachers have a question based game. You can choose the question for your student to answer. And you can make it into a mission in the game. Okay. And the game looks like this. Okay. Basically, this is, uh, uh, you know, usually the, uh, the education game nowadays, uh, they are very simple. Usually it's a single user game. But let me share with you that students nowadays, kids nowadays, they don't like single user game. Because when they play play game, they enjoy the interaction with other players and other users. So single user game, this kind of teaching game, this, this kind of education game is not much fun for kids nowadays. So our game is the first ever game that you have multiple people in the action together. So basically, each student has their own territory. And the purpose is you want to get more territory by taking one land, or you can even attack other people's land. So let's say you want this land, okay, you are trying to occupy this land, you just click on it, okay, and then the system will come up with a problem for you to solve, okay. And if you solve it correctly, and you are rich, you will solve it, okay. And then you create uh, 80 points of damage to the land, okay, and then if you, you can occupy this land, okay. And you can see that uh, uh, the land is an empty land at the beginning, okay. And why is that? I want to say this to a uh, professor from uh, uh, Howard. Because uh, when, when I received the, the overall award in Water Business School, I was invited to present my sister. Then after the, uh, my presentation, there's a professor from Howard. He came to me. He said, hey, Benson, I really like your game. He, he told me that he feel that this game is going to create a big impact to the education. But he told me that and he offered me some suggestion. I said, sure, please let me know. He said, hey, there's a young game that student can't reach other's land. That's too much competition. And he said, we Europeans don't like competition. <laughs> okay. So he, he urges me to have some more feature that even for kids who don't like competition, they can still have a lot of fun. So that's why with this uh, suggestion, that's why this is uh, a new version is that students initially get an empty land. Okay? But if for students who don't like to conquer other people's land, that's fine. The student can solve more problems to develop this land into all kinds of different landscape. Okay, like cherry forest, little farm, and you can even have your animal. So we have a lot of little, not in Taiwan, we have many little girls, you know, they don't like to conquer other people's land, but they have a lot of fun on this. Okay, they don't like competition, but they can still have a lot of fun. Okay. And we have very strong uh, teacher, a student, uh, uh, data analytics to help the teacher that students know where they are at. Okay, so this is very helpful for the student. And it turns out that when I use this, this game of Coursera, you can see that a lot of students, they, they work so hard because they care a lot about the worldwide ranking. And so many students, they solve more than 200 problems. So at the time, Coursera was so sharp because a lot of people take Coursera video, they only like to watch the video, they don't like to do the whole work. So Coursera was so sharp to see that our system was able to make students to solve more than 200 problems. So that's why Coursera, by the way, they wrote uh, on the official website, they wrote the official blog to introduce our system. Why were professors creating the first ever social education platform for both? And this is a response we got from a student, uh, especially from a student from China. This student wrote, it is a great pleasure starting Thomas at the dormitory right the school every day. Okay, this guy must be insane. Right? <laughs> okay. And then another student wrote, okay. With my table, I'm not, I don't worry about me not studying anymore. Okay? 
sounds like a, a commercial slogan. Okay. <laughs> so, students really can take it to learning. And actually, because I'm a professor, I'm also doing research on this. I really care about the correlation between the game score and the course grade. So, this one, uh, we conduct a, a little research on this. This is what we do. We classify the students into three groups uh, according to their game score. Low game score group, mid game score group, and high game score group. And we want to see the post grade distribution. And you can see that the, the post grade, the highest post grade region, 19 to 1 point region, you can see the green one is the tallest. Okay? Not just this one. All of the highest course region, green one is the tallest, which is the high game score group. All of the low game score, uh, all of the low cost per region, blue one is the tallest, which is the low game score group. So we do observe a strong correlation between the game score and the cost per. And then also according to the student's poll, we conducted on the Coursera, among as Coursera student, a lot of this is the thing that I like most. Near 90% of students agree that they are not able to finish more challenging tasks. The reason is because they enjoy the solving problem of the game, so they solve more and more problems. So eventually they have more confidence to finish more challenging tasks. And I think that's crucial for us to do that. Okay. So Pokemon really raises students' motivation in learning, and it's not just for whom. Actually, now our staff will provide a service to many people. In Taiwan now, today, we have more than 350,000 students, K-12 students, using our system okay, daily. And also our system is used uh, by the corporate training. And another thing is that the dental school in UPEN. Ivy League is using us as such a studio contract with us, they use it in their dental school, of course. So basically, this is a pen dental medicine journal uh, in, published by dental school in UPEN, and they, they specify, uh, they write an article on how they use Pakeo to help them uh, improve their dental school uh, education. And with this game, actually, we, are, we did something very interesting. Actually, last year, we hosted the first ever conference World Cup of 2016. And many people around the world enjoy the participating of the, the World Cup. Let me share with you the video clip that we will have time. Let me first ask you some questions. 
This is my challenge for the conventional teaching. Like, how much time does it need for a teacher to realize your student have wrong understanding about how you just talk? Let's say you teach something, but students have wrong understanding. How much time will you need to figure it out? The thing is that a lot of students, they don't like to ask questions. And not to mention that the students feel like they understand it. Okay? It's just because you know, they have wrong understanding, but they still feel that they understand it. So they wouldn't ask you a question. So what can you do? You can only find out through homework. But a lot of times students copy each other's homework or solution. When they come up with the homework solution, when they hand the homework, they always get perfect score. It's very difficult for you to find a student's learning problem, okay? especially in Asia. So that's one challenge we have as a, uh, in, in conventional teaching. And that's challenge we have is that does our student get engaged to our course week by week or do they only study the week before the midterm and final exam? Uh, a lot of students only study before the midterm exam. But can we make them study week by week? Okay, this is also a big challenge for us. So can we solve this problem? Actually, we can look at it as a problem. This, the best teacher ever in the history. Who are those guys? Okay. Surprise and confuses. Okay. Those are the I say to be the best teacher in the history. Okay. What do they have in common? They all they both have very long beard. Okay. So <laughs> what do they have? Other things in common. Well, they're teaching. If you look at their teaching, what they do is they just chit chat all day long. Right? They just chit chat with their students all day long. Like, you know, what confuses do is, you know, some of you might probably don't know Confucius well, but we grew up in Taiwan, we study a lot about Confucius. We know Confucius, but basically what Confucius do is, he likes to gossip a lot. You know, what Confucius usually, usually do is that when student A is not present, then he will usually tell the student B, say, let me tell you, the shortcoming of the student A is blah, 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 blah. Okay, he always likes to gossip about people's shortcoming at the back, okay? I should have asked him about the reasons, okay? <laughs> and Socrates is, is similar. You know, Socrates debate a lot with his students. That's very important when you learn uh, philosophy, okay? So basically what they do is that both of them, they have a lot of you know, dialogue with their students. And that's very important because, you know, now that when the book video is out there, let me share with you a, a true story. This is a, a, a university very famous in Taiwan. Not our, not, not, but not our university. There's a, a, a department that have a required course, and the professor who taught the course uh, taught very bad, okay, very bad. The student hated it. And some students found that Stanford offered a book teaching the same thing. So a lot of students start to watch the Stanford book at home. They don't go to the class. So when I talk about the classroom to the professor, I always tell them, you have these kind of students, just let them watch the video at home. Don't force them to come to your course. If you force your student to come to your course, this is what you're going to see. This student is going to sit at the very last row of the classroom and look at you like this. <laughs> and whenever you say something, then he will come to the wherever to the other Oh man, look at Oh man! Oh my god! Oh man! You know, if you have a student like that in your classroom, where's the, where's the, where's the dignity? Right? So let me show you. The, the thing is that the, what MOOC affect us most is that most of our teachers, we feel that our core values to give lectures in the classroom. But you can give your student lecture, the MOOC video can also give your student lecture. Right? If the student feels that the guy who talks in the video better, the student feels that the guy in the video is the teacher, and the person in the classroom is just normal. Right? So you can replace that video. This kind of thing already happens. Now a lot. So as a teacher, we need to think about what's our core value. Well, our core value should be what are the things that you can offer to your student, but the leader can offer to your student. That would be a core value, right? What is the thing that you can offer to your student, but the leader can offer to your student? Punishment. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. I think that the thing is dialogue. Dialogue is very important. Okay. Only you can have dialogue with your student, but the leader can have dialogue with your student. But if you ask the teacher to have more dialogue, you and the teacher will tell you, ah, I cannot do that because of the top bridge, because of silent students, because of absent students, because of lack of motivation, you know, all kinds of reasons why teacher will tell you that they cannot have more dialogue. 
So yes, do we just give up? No, we have a solution. Actually now, you don't have to worry about coverage, science student, and student lack of motivation to come worry about it. Students study in advance and actively ask questions. So what? Such goodies exist? Yes, free classroom. Okay. Every time, every time I talk about this, you know, I feel like I'm doing some like a direct sales. Okay. Do you have you heard about free classroom? You change your life. Okay. Okay. So let me show you a skill. A lot of people try free classroom but they didn't do it successfully. And there's their yeah, reason. The reason, the most important reason is because when you ask the student to watch the video, but the, the reality is that students don't have the habit of watching the video. So you want to conduct a flip classroom, the very important thing is it is your obligation to help students to establish the habit of watching the video. But how can you do that? This is the lesson I want to share with you. Stage one, helping them to establish the habit, okay? To help you understand the idea, I make this a graphic of a uh, okay? But please bear with me because it's very difficult to find a portrait of little girl with a PowerPoint. So bear with me, don't ask me why the little one is always not the ponytails. Okay? <laughs> I already changed the color of each kid's clothes. Okay? I spent a lot of effort with this. Okay? <laughs> okay. So the first thing you need to have is that you, do, you, you need to understand that a lot of times students don't watch the video is because they don't even have the experience of acquiring knowledge from the video. So at the very beginning, the most important thing is you have to make sure every student has the experience of acquiring knowledge from the video. So when you do the flip classroom, don't let them watch the video at home right away. Actually, what you need to do is to let them watch it in the classroom first. To let them get used to acquiring knowledge from the video. So at the very beginning of the semester, at the very first two weeks, you let them watch the video at home. Uh, 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 in the classroom, okay? And very interesting, when you want to make the video for your flip classroom, the first time I made the video for my, uh, for my uh, uh, flip classroom, I prepared a three hour lecture material. Okay, I usually do it in the classroom. I make the video in my study room. When I finished the video, making the video, I found that the video is about 75 minutes. So that's, you know, working the three hour lecture material, but when I make the video, it's only 75 minutes. Only half of the time. And I found that why? Why won't it have the time of missing? I watched a video and I found that I count all the topics, but still the time is only half of my or the usual lectures the time in the classroom. I found that the reason is because in the classroom, we teach it, a lot of time we repeat ourselves a lot. <coughs> and because we want to make sure the count, we want to make sure the students get distracted. So we want to make sure everybody hear what we say. So in the classroom we usually repeat ourselves two times or three times. But let me ask you this, if you have a student who have very high concentration level and very smart, whatever, whatever you say, he very concentrated and he understands it right away. Then this student have to wait for you to repeat for the second time and third time. You are wasting his time. Okay? And let's say you have a student who is like Einstein, and he has to think something through like four times or five times before he or she really understands the stuff. But when you teach for the second time or third time, you jump to the next topic. This student is okay, okay, can be sacrificed. So the top level distribution, the right most tail and left most tail in total, 30% of students, they are sacrificed. Because in the classroom, the conventional teaching, we repeat ourselves a lot. But when we make a video, we don't repeat ourselves. Because students, they can repeat the video. Because that's why when we make a video, we only talk once. And that's why the time is only about half of the lecture time. So in the classroom, when you show the video, it's about a half of the lecture time. You still have another half of your lecture to work on the problem to do the discussion. Okay? So I think you do this for two weeks. You can say, okay guys, now you're getting a feeling for watching the video. You can start watching the video at home. This way we have more time of group activities and do the class. Okay? So you can start to assign the video for them to watch at home. So let me ask you this. Do you think now students will go home, watch the video regularly? Nah, that's too naive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> students do not have to happen, okay? So how to make sure they actually watch the video at home? This is the beauty, okay? You know, I don't know the case in a regular school or in another school, but nowadays, a lot of students, they use Facebook a lot. Okay, so this is what I do. We need to use social media. Uh, every semester, I will start a Facebook group on Facebook, and I will demand every student to join that group. And I will do a lot of announcements, a lot of things on Facebook. Students now, they don't check email. They only care about the <coughs> But when they click on it, they found that it's 
me, but now since I'm doing okay? So it gets confused, but I got my purpose now, okay? So in Facebook group, this is one very useful function that you can post a uh, question to ask everybody. Let's say we want to have a group dinner together, we don't know what time was the best for everybody, right? So you can ask a question, you can ask three options, and people so you can use that. That's very helpful. This is what I do. Whenever I want the student to watch a video, I will post the link. Okay? I will ask a question, I will post the link for the for the video I wanted to watch. Then I will have three options I let them to choose. I didn't watch anything, I watch everything. I watch some of them. Then I ask every student, I say this is counted toward your participation grade. Anyone who finished the video, you have to click right away to let me, to let me know that you watch everything. Okay? So let's say there's some student fooling around at home after the class and he saw the little red tag and he clicked on it and he found that man, there are more, people, more than 40 classmates finished watching the video. Okay? So now they feel the urgency to watch the video. Okay? And now we even have an even more evil version. Okay? Because in Taiwan now, many students now are using that WeChat or using Line, those instant IM software. So this is what we do. We can compose, we, we form a discussion group, chat group about all students. And then I'll post the link, okay, watch this video about which thing. And then anyone who finish a video, I ask the student, you have to record it in the chat group. Okay? And this student go up, suddenly the serial phone vibrates on the left. Uh, oh, Benson finishes it. Uh, Tom finishes it. Uh, Michael finishes it. You see, yeah, if they have 30 students in the class, this server just keeps vibrating on his lap all night long. Okay, <laughs> this student physically feel the peer pressure of watching the video. So you can see that, wow, this is so, you know, when you sell this, this is so sharp. Right? So many people watch the video. So they have the peer pressure to watch the video. Before we introduce the social media, when we do a free classroom, we were able to only get to about 60% of the students to watch the video regularly. But after we use this method, we were able to push that number to 90% of the students watch the video regularly. It's so helpful. So helpful. Okay, so you can try that. It's very helpful. So what if there are still other students, still students who don't watch the video? Let's say you have a very important football game. Everybody watched football the other night and they didn't watch the video. What do you do? Okay, let's say you can ask the student how many of you watch the video? 60% of students watch the video. 40% of students who didn't watch the video. What do you do? Okay, a lot of teachers say, wow, 40% of students who need to watch the video, I better redo the lecture. Uh, never redo the lecture. That's the worst ever thing you can do in Flint classroom. Because if you redo the lecture, you piss off those 60% of students who watch the video. They say, hey, I, I follow your instruction, I watch the video, and now you're wasting my time to redo the lecture, then I don't want to do, watch the video anymore. So don't redo the lecture. But then the teacher says, man, if I don't redo the lecture, 40% of students who didn't watch the video, what should I do? Let me teach you. You can do this. Very simple. Okay? What? You didn't watch the video? Go to the back to watch. You cannot participate in our discussion of activities. Okay? So let's go to the back to watch the video. And then the other students will do those activities. Okay? And the secret is make sure the activities you, you decide for your class at the beginning of the semester is a lot of fun. Full of laptops. Okay? That's crucial. Okay? Because when those still watch the video, they see a lot, oh, teacher, this is so interesting. Oh, I like this activity so much. You know, they get some peace, okay, at themselves. So after two or three weeks, students will start to watch the video regularly. And this is also very important. You need to give them time to make up their loss. If they don't watch the video this time, after this lecture, if you give them one day to watch another piece of new video, then they will have, they will have two pieces of video behind. Other students, okay? So you need to give them time to make up the loss. That's very important, okay? Okay, now after you build up and establish the habit of watching the video, what do you do in the class? Okay, let me share with you. This is very important, very simple. D minus seven, okay? You can use social media or any kind of maybe Google, uh, 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 Google screen, okay? You can then inform the students to watch the video one week before. And then the day before your class, you know, you prepare a list of problems that you want to go through in the classroom. And make sure you do understand, do realize how to solve this problem. Because students are still ask you and you don't know how to solve it, that's very embarrassing, okay? So you need to make sure you understand the solution. And this is what you do in the classroom, okay? 
The thing is that you don't need you don't need a, a, a special hardware. Each group one piece of device that can go to the the Okay, you can have Cinderella or Chromebook. It's one device each group. Okay. So this is what we do. At the very beginning, let's do the last. Do they have any question about the video? Okay. It's very interesting. We found that when we do a free classroom this way, students tend to ask more questions in the classroom. The reason is because if you do a conventional lecture, students have to, they have a pressure to ask. When they ask, when they have something they don't understand, uh, they don't dare to ask. They feel like they're wasting everybody's time. So they can't always tell themselves, "Well, I study at home, I can figure it out on myself." Okay. So maybe it's that that is crucial to ask it right away. But if you do free classroom, student watch at home, video at home already. He could have, he or she could have it, he repeated it again, again, and again, still not understand it. Now student know that with, by himself, he cannot solve the problem. Teacher is his only home. So that's why when they come to classroom, they have more urge to ask you questions. Okay? And you solve that question, you can explain it and make sure they understand about the video. And this is what you do next. Okay? How we do is we use Google Home a lot. Okay. Each, at the beginning of class, we ask every group of students to use the Google Home to report how many, how many of you watch the video. Okay, so, group member number one, what's your name? Tom, did you finish watching the video? Yes. Group number, member number two, did you finish watching the video? Yes. Now, we intentionally using one device in the group. The reason is because when everybody click on it, you know, your class, your team members watching on you. Okay, if you didn't finish watching the video, everybody look at you and you have to say, I, I didn't watch the video in front of everybody. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. So, with this, a lot of students will finish watching the video and they will start doing the problem in class. And now, you don't need any device. You only need <coughs> papers. Okay, make sure that every student has their own notebook, uh, uh, the, the, the notes to write the problem. Okay, you post the problem, you let them work on the problem, and then I start to walk along. And you can start walking along, okay? So go, you guys are doing great, okay? Or you guys are stuck, okay? And that's very important because this is the first time in the classroom that you can actually see students' problem. And that's the first time that you can see students' learning problem, right? Away. If any student have problem understanding about how they learn, you can observe it right away. And you can give them hints, give them hints, okay? And usually you might walk around, you might see more than one third of the students have misunderstanding about how we talk in the video. I can fix it right away. I can go to the stage. Okay, guys, I found that a lot of you have problem understanding about this theory. Let me tell you what it is about. You can fix the problem effort right away, okay? And also, you can see that students have more, they are really have more dialogue with me. Because when they have a dialogue with me, they don't feel like they're wasting other people's time. They don't feel being accused of being a teacher's pet. Okay, the conversation is only only a person within the group, so they feel less pressure to talk to me, and that's a very good way for you, help you a lot to build connections with the student. Okay. Okay. So you keep doing this, and then when the time is up, then you can you can see that you use a visualizer. Why is a visualizer very very important? Because you don't want you don't want to waste other students' time to for the student to copy the answer to the board. So we use a visualizer and we draw the student to answer the problem, okay? They show their answer with the visualizer right away and they explain it. If they do it right, the whole group get bonus point for this, okay? And if the student, you can also try students' presentation. If a student presents the solution well, the group can get another bonus point, okay? And that's very helpful for students. And then you keep doing this and until the end of the, of the class, okay? Then what do you do? We let the students grade each other. The grade is that this group of students can give their uh, four notes to the, in the other group, and this group can to group three, group six can to group four, and then they start the group grading. And then at the end of the class, you let them to use Google Form okay, to report the grading result. And each group, they, they fill in the group like this. Which group are you? We are group number two. Which group do you grade? We grade group number one. And in problem one, how many group members in group one do we correct? Four. In the whole group, we get four points. In problem two, how many people are getting right? We just click on it, problem one, and then submit. And then all the score are rewarded. So by this way, no more homework grading. 
and students actually they work it very hard, very suddenly, because you get to see their process in the class, and you can help them. Okay, so this is what we do. A lot of teachers now in Taiwan now they are doing the classroom uh, find similar methods. So the idea is we create competition among the groups. Okay, competition. A lot of people worry about whether competition is not healthy for the student. But the, the, the issue is that, the, the key is that we create competition from other groups. So it's the whole group that shares the pressure, so it makes it much more healthy. And because of this competition of other group, actually you will, enjoy, you will, you will, you will get, get to see students' collaboration with the other group. Okay, and we, want, we all want the students to learn how to collaborate with other people, right? So this is the key of our, 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 our peer-to-peer teaching, okay? So I just want to, in summary, I want to tell you that uh, from my observation, students nowadays are very different from us. You know, peer pressure and peer recognition can really drive our students really hard. So in your teaching, you can start to think about how can you use the power of peers to get students much more motivated. And in my opinion, you know, we need to let students to take more initiative. Today I share with you uh, to let students design their own more problems. Actually, we have also other design that we let students to do more uh, for instance. We have a lot of uh, things that we let students do their own grading, we let the students to uh, figure out the theory instead of teaching them the theory right away. Okay? You know, we have a lot of uh, other ways, but because of time, so I can only share with you uh, uh, the BJP today. So, and also, today we talk about in classroom, okay? Uh, it's another way to let students more, to have more initiative, and the peer can help each other and solve the problem together. So, it really frees up the time and students learn more efficiently and you want that. So in the future we should teach more like that, okay? So basically, you know, we should do like a lecture. Instead of being a lecture, we should do a facilitator. But the thing is that a lot of us don't have the experience to do a facilitator and we feel, you know, a lot of pressure to do this. But let me share with you my experience. If you think back before you being a teacher, you don't have that much time to give lectures, but when we start to teach, you know, after one semester we become very good lecture. Similar similar thing for, for being a facilitator. The first time I tried to facilitate a discussion, I feel a lot of pressure because, you know, I have a problem. Usually, I can hide my expression. You know, when I ask a question, if you still come up with a very stupid answer, I just cannot hide my expression, okay? But, you know, after one semester, I become much more better than this. When I ask a question, and some student come up with a very stupid answer, and then I will, hmm, interesting. Okay, okay. But every once in a while, you will have a student who give you a very, very, very stupid answer. I couldn't even say very interesting, okay? <laughs> so after the last semester, I became quite bad at this. I asked some question, and I said, the student give me a very bad answer. I was like, hmm. I will ask him, what do you think about his answer? <laughs> okay. I will direct the, the question to other people, okay? okay. So eventually, I after two, or two semesters, so I become much more better in facilitating. Facilitating discussion. So I think we don't have to worry about that. So in the future, you know, previously our, our role is like a lecturer or like an actor, okay? But in the future, our role will be like a producer. You try to decide the activities. And you, like a host, you let students to discuss, to express what they learn. Okay? That will be our new role in the new era of teaching, okay? So this is my sharing today, and that's what the student. Okay. If you have any uh, further uh, questions or uh, you know, feel free to, to contact me. Okay. And this is my Facebook group. And I'm surprised I have the first professor here to register <laughs> the Facebook. Okay. So the professor here uh, is, is me on Facebook. And if you have more, uh, you want to have more information, then please also feel free uh, to refer to our book. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you.
So with this, uh, these are kind of three of the things that, that I found that was maybe with me early on. Um, there's questions that are already at the right hand side. What do you value as a teacher? Right? Is it the same as what students value? Um, and what, what motivates them to really, to really do the things that, that you want them to do? Uh, what can you bring to the educational experience that the computer can? A lot of people say, you know, we, uh, we uh, want to be, uh, or the fear for being replaced by computers. Well, if you are fearful of that, you probably should be. Because <laughs> the things that you're doing can be done by a computer, and you're not having any values. What would bring that human experience? And that last, last part I put in there about teaching students how to learn with technology. You don't have, they don't know how to learn with technology necessarily by default, but they, uh, they, we think that they are assuming they know for all of those things. So, so we're uh, in the interest of time. We're gonna we're gonna shorten things up and change the schedule around a little bit. I'll mention that in a second. Um, the breakout EDU link now works. Sorry about that. That's rookie rookie mistake there. I didn't share it. So if you go to that, uh, the there are still some spots left. So so Taiwan EDU for breakout is the uh, short URL for that. Um, after each event, after each session, in the app. You can tap on uh, at the bottom and evaluate the session, and you're given a rating scale there from everything from a Kumoji, whose name is Hanky, the new man, the real Kumoji's name is Hanky, uh, all the way up to a unicorn, which is outstanding. So, although it may be fun to give people Kumojis, um, please treat that as a, as a kind of a one to four scale on that. Um, this afternoon, after our last session, we have a demo slam here where we will be up and we're going to demonstrate some really fun, cool, um, interesting feature that we know how to do that you might uh, uh, find interesting and might applicable to your, your situation. Um, but this is also the chance that you have to win some prizes, including a surprise. Uh, and uh, during the break, if you want to, you can stop at the Wonder Bar. That's uh, the registration desk. If you want to ask us any questions, uh, we'll be there to answer, to answer those for you guys. If you have that one thing that you really want to figure out, come by and see us there. So we do have a lot of sponsors that help make all this stuff happen. We are diamond all sponsors, and then we'll give you some more information in a second. Um, we have, as well, if you want to go to the we have uh, different levels um, of uh, sponsors throughout. And two that we have visiting here with us today are Ace Group Education. So they have some of their devices and some of uh, their uh, uh, product lines that are available to you guys to look at, including the R11, which I have been really looking down there, which is actually really, really cool. Um, so you can stop by and see them. And, and also we would like to help we borrow from Text Help, both of uh, which has some fantastic products, um, including some mathematics uh, stuff with uh, uh, the Genie's GMAP speech or GMAP uh, applications that are that are part of that are available to you guys as well. So stop by and visit them in the dining hall. Uh, during the breaks and during lunch, they'll be around at that time. So, 1020 is when we're going to change the schedule. You can refresh the app, went out of the app, and come back into it, and there will be an updated time. I know those things also, I'll squeeze a few breaks down here in the morning, maybe she's lunch a little bit. So watch those apps, but we're starting at 10 20. Or is that right? You're so yeah. Yeah, So you have about 15 minutes to get to the next session. Um, and then I want to just say that the sessions are basically on the second floor, which is the floor that we're on right now, um, and on the ground floor, level one. Most of the, most of the uh, Mandarin sessions are level one, most of the English sessions are level two. So that's all we have for you today. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming to this uh, opening session. And let's 
you can grab just some snacks instead of uh, on the way to, or in the dining hall. You can want to grab some uh, food on your way to your session.